Hi, I'm Richard, Trails of the City, Footprints of London and Other Places History Tour Guide, and welcome to the sixth instalment of Trails Live History Casts, live broadcasts that I'm doing at 6 p.m. every Tuesday evening during this very difficult coronavirus lockdown period, and which I'm featuring on different London historic characters, which I've included in various of my walks over the years. And this week's character is Robert Cecil, Lord Chelwood, great man of peace and the main architect of the League of Nations, the first truly international organization set up to maintain world peace. And I researched into Lord Chelwood when putting together my walk, The Peacemakers of Belgravia in 2019. And that focused on the historic characters associated with the area who had endeavored to secure European and world peace and order. And it also marked the centenary that year of the signing of the Versailles Treaty, which uh, required the League of Nations to be established. And Lord Cecil had his London family home in Belgravia at 16 South Eaton Place from 1922 until the year of his death in 1958. Edgar Algernon Robert Cecil was born in 1864, the third son of the Marquis of Salisbury, three times Conservative Prime Minister, and from an illustrious aristocratic and political family that was at the heart of English and British politics going back to Elizabethan times. After Eton and studying law at Oxford, he made his first career as a barrister, and was appointed to the Queen's Council in 1889 at only 25. His political career started in 1906 and he served as Conservative MP for the constituencies of East Marylebone in London and Hitchin in Hertfordshire. And now the character descriptions that I've read of Lord Cecil paint him as a rather gaunt, dry, unsmiling, eagle-nosed sort of chap, a bit of a, a fusty, fussy, Dickensian character type. But he was a man of very high ideals, who also carried with him a strong sense of duty from uh, as a legacy of his great family background. On the outbreak of the First World War, Cecil was already 50 in 1914, and he volunteered for the Red Cross to serve in field hospitals behind the lines on the Western Front. And he spoke of his war experience, experiences as affecting him very deeply, as being absolutely appalled with the extent of destruction of life and property that it resulted in. Now, it's a bit of a truism, isn't it, that it was President Woodrow Wilson who came up with the League of Nations in 1919. Well, not so. Uh, Robert Cecil had been floating the idea years earlier and worked up a mechanism for it and put it in a memorandum in September 1916 that was circulated around Whitehall. And when the Paris Peace Treaty, Paris Peace Conference was set up in January 1919, Cecil was appointed to the British delegation to lead them on that subject as the given expert. And Wilson had required it to be enshrined in the Versailles Treaty, but Cecil found him, although a man of high ideals, to have very little idea of the practical and logistical issues with setting up such an, a, 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 an institution and extremely unaware of European history as well. And it was Cecil, along with General Smuts, also on the British delegation, who drafted the convention. It's another historic given isn't it that the League, although born of very grand ideals, was ultimately naive and doomed to failure? Well, let's briefly consider this. Its main aim was to stop wars and so to encourage disarmament. 
also to uh, uh, protect nation states and the rights of minorities. Conveniently, this didn't quite stretch to colonial possessions of uh, Western empirical countries, and rather hypocritically, you might say. It had other goals as well, to improve uh, working conditions, to control the spreading of contagious diseases, extremely relevant today, uh, to prevent international drug trafficking, and at its inaugural assembly meeting in December 1920, 42 countries sent delegates. And of course, the British delegate was Robert Cecil. And by the early 1930s, 58 countries had actually signed up to it. And it did have some initial successes. In 1921, it managed to arbitrate between Finland and Sweden to prevent a possible flare up into a war situation there, and did likewise between Greece in Bul and Bulgaria in 1925. And during the Turkish War of Independence in 1920, following the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, it provided independent aid to around 100 and, to I beg your pardon around one and a half million refugees that were a consequence of that conflict the very first time that any of that kind of aid had been established but of course there were deep problems from the beginning not least of which was the fact that congress had never ratified the terms of the League's uh, uh, covenant, and uh, so America never joined. Neither did Russia, and Germany was excluded. And Cecil had been a very belligerent advocate to, for the importance of including Germany. It, it perhaps lacked teeth with no uh, backup army of its own peacekeeping force, as we might think today. And it perhaps ended up being vulnerable to individual member states' own national interests, not the least was Britain's. And when a motion was brought to an assembly meeting in 1923 to say that on the event of any illegal invasion, well, then it was the obligation of other member states to send forces uh, in defense, uh, then Britain wasn't prepared uh, to, to do that uh, because their forces were committed in colonial countries trying to hold the empire together. And then, of course, uh, the League was also uh, threat, uh, uh, judged to be poorly managed, under-resourced, you know, sometimes actual allegations of deliberate mismanagement. And when it came to the rise of the 1930s uh, autocrats and with Mussolini's invasion of Abyssinia and then Japan going into Manchuria, and Hitler's increasingly belligerent military occupations throughout Europe, well then the League was only able to impotently stand aside and do nothing. But what was Cecil doing uh, at the time? From 1924 to 27, he actually served in Baldwin's Conservative government as the uh, acted as the representative, uh, British representative to the League of Nations. He was made Lord Chelwood in 1923, which is the village of his country family home in Sussex. He was a conservative politician, but very much to the left of the party, resigning twice actually, both on matters of principle and trying to form, realign the, the party, forming a new sector of it. And uh, in 1927, he resigned from Baldwin's cabinet, uh, not being able to support the, the uh, Britain's reluctance to support a motion to encourage naval disarmament. 
uh, but he carried on through the rest of the 30s, promoting the aims of the League of Nations and becoming the president of the Union of the League of Nations. And it was in 1937 that he was quite rightly awarded, amongst other uh, accolades during his long life and career, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. But sadly, in that same year, he came to the to the conclusion conceded that it was right then for Britain to start to rearm now in the light of looking a uh, uh, building a uh, global conflict to looking like it was about to start. And in 1944, uh, Churchill wrote to Cecil in these terms. My dear Bob, this war could easily have been prevented if the League of Nations had been used with courage and loyalty by the associated nations. You are entitled to, entitled to mellow reflections while, even while the storm rages. And then uh, Cecil continued to, even after the League of Nations folded, uh, to support its successor, the United Nations, and was a long time the trumpeter of peace, saying that the uh, ultimately uh, the only political object worth fighting for was peace. Well, thanks very much again, everyone. And next time we're going further into the 20th century, into the 60s, in fact, into the swinging 60s for a complete change of tack. So. Uh, Thanks for watching. I hope this was interesting and I hope that it was actually doubly relative, uh, relevant at this time with the approach of the 75th anniversary of the end of the uh, uh, of war in Europe and uh, with really a time in this pandemic crisis when we should be championing international agreements and uh, organizations. So uh, thank you. Stay at home protect the NHS and save lives. Bye bye.